Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for coming to join this roundtable discussion on preventing extremism and building resilient societies in fragile states. Uh, we know that this overlaps with, with lunchtime, so we're particularly grateful to have a room full of people and, and look forward to a great conversation. I'm also pleased to be joined by a, a distinguished panel. Um, you have their bios uh, in the program, uh, but just briefly to introduce uh, Mr. Nikolai Milad Miladinov, sorry, um, who is the Special Coordinator for the Middle East Peace Process of the United Nations. We have His Excellency Vladimir Vronkov, Undersecretary General for the United Nations Counterterrorism Office. We have Dr. Ruth Beitler, who's a professor at the US Military Academy at West Point. And we also have with us Ambassador Christian Book, um, who's the Director of Near and Middle East and North Africa um, at the Federal Foreign Office in Germany. And finally, my colleague from the US Institute of Peace, Dr. Eli Abouan, who leads the Middle East and North Africa programs. Uh, my name is Susan Stigant. I direct the Africa program at the US Institute of Peace in Washington. So this morning so far in the sessions, we've heard a number of areas that highlight the change taking place in the global governance picture. We've heard about areas of divergence um, and the con continue imperative for action and joint action, whether that's related <clears throat> to extremism, ongoing violence and civil wars, climate change and demography. But one area where I think there is clear convergence is on this question of prevention and resilience. Um, and a, a shared understanding that there is a tremendous need to approach some of these challenges with a long-term preventive lens. And there's been some good news, I think, over the last couple of days. The Global Terrorism Index showed that, again, um, the number of terrorist in incidents has decreased um, this year. But at the same time, we know that the geographic reach of terrorism continues to expand. Um, and that many of the underlying drivers, the reasons that people might be recruited into terrorist activities, have yet to be addressed. Um, so as, as we start to think about these, this urgency of action, our other challenge is to think about how to operationalize a prevention approach and how to deal with this question of resilience in very concrete terms. And as we, as we start off, I just wanted to share um, a, a project that the US Institute of Peace was involved with as the United States tried to think about their approach to preventing extremism. Um, drawing on the past work of the 9-11 Commission um, and with a mandate from the US Congress, um, an eminent group of people came together to think about what would be a strategic approach to prevention. And they came up with essentially three pillars. Uh, and I hope that we can use this as a, a springboard for some of our conversation. The first was the need for a shared understanding um, of, of an approach to prevention. Um, with, the, with the recognition that this is a political and ideological problem and therefore requires an appropriate solution. Um, and particularly that this needs to be based on partnerships that advance um, towards governing account with accountability. The second pillar um, and recommendation was for the United States government to operationalize a strategic prevention framework. Um, one of the challenges that, that we have seen in, in the US government is that roles and responsibilities within the executive are not clear. Um, at some points, maybe different parts of the government are working at cross purposes with each other, um, and that it's critical to have flexible and long-term funding available so that different agencies can act accordingly. And then the third recommendation um, was to rally the international community together because this is not something that can be solved by one country or by one approach um, and with the development of a, a partnership development fund. So these are, this is not something that is necessarily translated into policy and practice yet, but it is an active debate in the United States. Um, and I hope that that, that framing maybe, maybe leads us into the conversation. So I wanna start us off with, with a, a broad question to each of our panelists, and we're going to try to keep it a conversation. Um, and, and I'll turn to you first, sir. Um, in your view, what, what are some of the most critical developments that have taken place in this discussion on prevention and resilience that we should have at the top of our minds as we go into this conversation about governance? Um, and in this conversation in particular, we're not just talking about the global governance, but I think we also need to think about regional governance frameworks, national governance frameworks, and governance that trickles down to communities. So, Susan, thank you very much for inviting me for this very important and interesting discussion. You mentioned uh, your project, the project of your institute. I think it's a very good contribution to this discussion. What should be done 
from the point of view of prevention better in order to proceed forward. You used also uh, the term uh, fragile state in your report, mm -hmm. and I think it's also a big challenge for the humankind how to deal with these states. First of all, of course, we need to understand definition, what does it mean, fragile state, because if there is no definition, it's difficult to use international framework for support of these <coughs> countries. But I think it's the major challenge, speaking about prevention policy or speaking about counter-terrorism activities. If there is a lack of state on the territory of a state, it creates vacuum which could be filled in a very fast manner by terrorist narratives. I think it's one of the most important issues we should tackle in the context of countering uh, violent extremism and terrorism as a whole. Mm -hmm. This is the first issue. The second issue, of course, uh, we're speaking about ideology. Mm -hmm. Ideology is the toughest material to be changed, so to prevent the appearance of this ideology. Mm -hmm. We need to have a variety of instruments. And uh, I think your report was very important from point of view also U.S.-centric approach. Mm -hmm. uh, Counterterrorism built on a very simple rule. Each country is uh, responsible for fight against terrorism, first of all, by itself. If there is no country, if, if there is no national factor in countering terrorism, we could, um, we could uh, be in a very difficult situation, and the example of uh, uh, Iraq and Syria showed this. When mm -hmm. country is weak, when government is weak, it appears immediately the threat of terrorism. But you know, one model for future development, mm -hmm. in my humble opinion, is not enough. By the way, here in Qatar, we could see that model could be different one mm -hmm. for different countries. Mm -hmm. So I think the more model of developments, the less room for filling the brains, brains of people by terrorist narratives. Mm. So I think it's also a task for the international community, a task for the United Nations, mm -hmm. to give chance to different models to be promulgated, promoted, as a way forward in the development of humankind. I think it's, again, a very important issue. And Great. again, in your report, it was very interesting and very important to read that international law from the point of view of stability, prevention of radicalization, prevention of violent extremism and counter-terrorism is very important. I will, uh, I'm going if, if, to come back to you for specific questions, um, okay. but I'd like to get, draw everybody into the conversation and then pick up on, on the points that you've raised, if that's okay. Ambassador, I'm going to turn to you and ask you the same question. If, if we're thinking about one, ideally one top priority in, in, in critical developments on prevention and resilience, what, what would it be in your mind? Thank you. It's very difficult to point out one. From my <coughs> rather practical experience at the receiving end of extremism and also of violent extremism, in several countries. Um, I would ask the question first, and this is the strategic level that, that was mentioned, why does it work? Why does it attract people? And the political economy uh, of extremism is not dissimilar to the one of a company or of a political party. You need to have a product, you need to have an idea, and you need to have the business climate to operate in. So the business climate, that's maybe the easiest part. It's easiest in fragile states, and it's easiest in ungoverned spaces. So my number one priority would be to reduce uh, ungoverned spaces on the map, uh, uh, because they are the place where extremism lives. Um, and the second is um, we need to address the issues. We need to address the ideas and the products. Um, starting with the products. if. Um, Daesh succeeds uh, because it provides uh, a vehicle registration and uh, um, a sort of, of governance, then we must ask ourselves uh, why can't the states there not produce enough governance to compete effectively? Um, we could go further in this, uh, but maybe one, one reflection on the ideas. Um, because this is the strongest motive. This is what feeds the narrative of extremist organization. Mm -hmm. If you have felt injustice, for mm -hmm. instance, through foreign interference or uh, an occupation of a country um, or through um, 
an idea, an organization being pushed outside the legitimate uh, uh, political uh, uh, theater, um, then there is no space for it to operate there. Um, then there is a motivation for it to attract um, followers. This is what we must address. Great. I think that's a good pivot point to turn to Nikolai. You're sitting in the midst of a, of a peace process um, and have experience working in various different countries. Um, from your perspective, prevention, resilience, what, what should we be paying attention to that, that maybe we're not or what is top of mind at the moment? I wouldn't say it's much of a peace process these days. Um, but thank you for uh, framing the discussion this way because I think this is perhaps the most fundamental question that we all need to answer and, and we still lack the... Um, I think the conceptual framework to address the challenges that at least in the Middle East we collectively face. On one end you have an international um, system, an international architecture that is imploding um, at a certain level um, and it was, is not really suited to react to the current way that threats are developed because threats are no longer between states, they're within states. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the tools, for example, with us in the United Nations have been based on a very different conceptual framework. Um, we need to approach things both from the bottom up and from the top down mm -hmm. approach. So internationally, we need to have a, a framework that actually prevents conflicts. Um, and I would say that our first priority must be preventive diplomacy these days, um, particularly in the Middle East. There are far too many hotspots that have exploded into outright conflicts and we can't afford more, far great, great risks of miscalculation. Um, um, and mistakes, but we also need to realize that it is not enough to just approach this from a state, from a from the basis of states, because a lot of the problems are internal. Mm -hmm. And if I look into a little bit more detail of what happened in Iraq a few years ago with Daesh or mm -hmm. Syria or, or even in Gaza these days, um, um, it is to me at least the realization that if you, um, within a state, if you deprive a community from its participation in decision-making long enough. Mm -hmm. um, if you segregate it long enough, if you leave it in isolation long enough, um, if you oppress it long enough, it implodes. Mm -hmm. And when it implodes, it becomes very fertile ground for radicals uh, to, to, to take over mm -hmm. the narrative. Um, so it's not enough to come up with an international framework that addresses the um, questions at an interstate level, but it, in, uh, between states, but it's also important to look at um, uh, how we can um, address them internally. And from our more practical day-to-day -day experience in the UN, it is really focusing on preventive diplomacy on the ground, hand in hand mm -hmm. with um, a, a strong development framework that addresses social issues um, on the ground. Of course, for that, you need the, 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 the strong partnership with, uh, uh, with states um, and with institutions that they can deliver. And on both ends, I think, both on the development framework and on the preventive diplomacy side of um, things we are still um, um, stumbling upon the new mechanisms that mm -hmm. we are we are using, and we still haven't put them in a conceptual framework as we as we must at one point. Great, thanks. Um, this this notion of uh, fostering a healthy state society relationship where people are included and feel included comes up over and over again. Um, Dr. Ruth, I want to bring you you into the conversation here um, in terms of prevention and resilience. Where what do you think is something that we should keep top of mind in this this conversation? Thank you. I first want to thank our hosts here in Qatar. And I also just want to make a quick disclaimer that I am speaking. These are my own personal views, and I don't represent the Department of Defense of the United States. Um, I think what is a, a critical issue in uh, prevention and resilience to me is the recognition that programs must be context-specific and population-centric. The human security issues, which dovetails, of course, on what you mentioned, meeting the basic needs of population is extraordinarily important. Also, this understanding that the precipitants to violence differ from place to place, from individual to individual, is critical in how we address, then, these particular problems. Mm -hmm. And another factor that I find that is important that we keep on top of, and it's connected to what I just mentioned on the context specific, is this notion of the development of civil societies, the role of NGOs and other local players. Mm -hmm. And I know we'll get to discuss that more as we go on. Great, thanks. Um, Eli, you work a lot at the community level and then also trying to bridge that up to the national level. From, from, from that vantage point on this question of pre prevention resilience, what, what's top of mind for you? Well, um, well thank you for, uh, for hosting uh, me on this panel. Uh, 
uh, our, uh, indeed, our work uh, with the communities in Iraq, Syria, and Libya, and other places show that uh, you know the the core of the prevention starts uh, at the community level, uh, and uh, uh, our work, our experience with these communities showed that it is possible to get the key community actors agree on some paradigms or principles mm -hmm. that would help in the overall uh, effort of preventing further. Uh, uh, further violence, further radicalization. Uh, you know, one example is uh, <coughs> that I, I like to give because it's, I think it's a very good example is that in, in, in South Kirkuk, we worked with a number of tribe leaders over uh, a year or so, and they agreed on, uh, for example, on a framework uh, that would define who is an ISIS family, how, you know, what criteria they would use to say this family is uh, affiliated with ISIS or not and within their own tribal law, how they would deal with it. Mm -hmm. uh, and these arrangements were also, you know, somehow blessed by the religious, uh, the Shia religious institution in Najaf. So overall, we came uh, to, a com to a result that uh, helped this community when the IDPs returned to their places to uh, basically prevent further violence, but also to prevent further radicalization, because as as in other communities uh, or in other places, people when they returned, they were subject to retaliation, they further went to become more radicalized. Mm -hmm. so, so this is one concrete example of how we can work it at the community level, and okay. on top of everything else, of course. Great. Thanks for giving that concrete example. We often end up talking about these terms that seem very broad, and it's hard to imagine what that looks, looks like in practice. Um, Mr. Undersecretary General, I want to come back to you because I think um, one of the challenges is to think through how to mobilize a framework, how to mobilize the international system, how to make the case for prevention in a way that, that member states and regional organizations and countries buy into this approach. And I, I wonder if you can share any reflections from, from having been a part of and, and leading that process. Yep. Part of the mandate of my office is to draw attention, more attention uh, from the member states to the issue of prevention of radicalization, to the prevention of violent extremism, to keep this part of our agenda very high in the political agenda of the Secretary General. So we are trying to do utmost. Uh, first of all, we have agreement with a number of countries and we are organizing together with them conferences of different, uh, on different parts of counter-terrorism agenda. For example, the last conference was held a month ago in Budapest, and the title of the conference was Prevention of Radicalization for Central Europe and for Balkans. I think it was very interesting to listen to how a number of countries are dealing with this issue of foreign terrorist fighters mm -hmm. that came to fight in Syria and Iraq from these very countries because it's a real preventive agenda. Mm -hmm. If uh, it was in place, this preventive agenda, I think these people uh, decided not to choose this very way. Mm -hmm. So it was a really very interesting discussion about how to stop this possible inflow of people to the terrorist organizations and also how to try to recover these people, of course, after prosecution, after all necessary procedures. So it's a practical engagement from our side in order to make this preventive agenda more and more efficient. Moreover, uh, uh, in uh, 2016, it was adopted uh, the plan of action to prevent violent extremism by the Secretary General. It's a very important international framework to be used by the national legislation in order to create a set of principles how to work with civil society organizations, mm -hmm. how to proceed forward with human rights and rule of law in countering radicalization and prevention of mm -hmm. violent extremism, how to engage youth in uh, the counterterrorism and prevention of violent extremism agenda, communities, and so on and so forth. So it's a document, well-established documents with a number of principles agreed by the member states. And I think the promotion of this document, mm -hmm. yeah, to the transformation of this document to national strategies and action plan is also a very important part of our activities. I can say that 
as for now 61 country has uh, have uh, the whole national plan of action on prevention of violent extremism. Mm -hmm. And we will be uh, promoting this document more and more because it's a very solid ground for mm -hmm. preventive work. Great. And uh, different elements of this plan of action is used in 91 countries. So it's again a very holistic, very wide geographical approach to this very issue. Thank you. Uh I mean, I'd be curious to hear a little bit more about how, how do you see that playing out in, in your work um, broadly? And, and I want to put another broad issue set on the table, which um, relates to the, the role of, of security forces. You know, we mm -hmm. talked about governance and ungoverned spaces. We talked about the notion of inclusion um, and injustices. And we've seen consistently that, that something that can be a real tipping point is, is abuses by security forces. And we often face this dilemma where there are real security threats that need to be addressed rest. Um, yet there needs to be this investment in, in reshaping the state society relationship in the midst of um, tense and, and serious security situations. Um, so curious to hear a little bit about how that comes together for you in applying a framework um, and, and living that um, in, in the countries where you work. Well, if, if I had to oversimplify it to begin with and take it down to a very um, person-centered third approach on the ground, I would say that um, you can't just deal with the security aspect of it for a number of reasons. And, and the main reason can be summarized in a, something that um, um, I heard recently someone say, look, we don't mind that we don't have the vote to elect our leaders, mm. but we could at least have jobs. So when you don't have both participation and development, um, then it is not just a matter of addressing um, uh, questions as a security concern because you will always end up with a situation which will pressure people um, and, and, and ultimately explode uh, because it, it doesn't resolve the very fundamental challenges that, that communities face. Um, on a practical basis, over the last year and a half or two years, um, we've been engaged in, um, in Iraq, uh, sorry, in, in Gaza, um, in trying to prevent another war. Um, and the way that we've done it is by approaching it on a threefold level. Firstly, by re admitting that there is a real security issue that needs to be addressed, the security at, at defense between Gaza and Israel and the threat of incidents and shootings um, there. Secondly, to address the uh, grave humanitarian concerns inside. And thirdly, to come up with a political uh, process. Because if you, if you don't address it as a holist holistically in that sense, but try and deal only with the security or only with the humanitarian or only with the political, um, you can't really uh, control the process. And this has given us the ability over the last um, um, year and a half, two years, um, together with Egypt and, and Qatar, uh, to contain the situation and, and to hopefully prevent another escalation. Taking a little bit of a different perspective, going back to, to Iraq, in 2014, when Daesh took over Mosul, um, the real threat was then that um, uh, Iraqi uh, institutions will not be able to respond um, uh, to, 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 to this threat in a, in a, in a constructive manner. And our, our challenge was to bring everyone back into the political process and make sure that the state institutions continue to function. Now, however, if you look at the situation much later, if state institutions promote only violence, um, and security, um, the security apparatus as a means of um, um, uh, you know, resolving conflicts without addressing the deep, profound social and economic and cultural and, and, and other problems that exist, uh, you will end up where you started. Mm -hmm. and, and where you started with is collapsed communities, uh, uh, open prey for radicalization, um, and, and for outside interference. Um, I want to turn to Ely and, and the ambassador to come in here because it, it strikes me that the kind of three-pronged approach that you're talking about and raising these economic practical needs that people have has to be brought together with the conflict resolution and dialogue um, approaches and building confidence with people. And, and I'm wondering, Ely, ambassador, is this, is this similar to what you've seen in, in your work? Um, and how in particular do you think about creating a situation where governments are able to respond to these demands of their citizens, to very reasonable demands for, for service delivery? And, and how can the international community work better um, in that type of partnership? Thank you. It's certainly easier within one state um, if 
you have mechanisms to address simultaneously the economic and the political grievances um, that drive extremism. Um, it is more complicated in a setting such as Gaza. Um, uh, Nikolai knows all about it. Uh, um, when you stand on the beach of Gaza, uh, you cannot help but imagine how this could look like. Um, and uh, it's essentially the same piece of real estate uh, that you find 30 miles up the coast in Tel Aviv, uh, um, if only, only with less economic opportunities. But only addressing these, um, as important as it is, is not enough because at the same time you need to address the political uh, um, issues um, if you want to prevent extremism. There's of course also the possibility of containing this or uh, um, dealing with it in another means, but we are talking here about preventing extremism. If that's the strategic objective, mm -hmm. um, then it's fairly easy to see that uh, the, the, the root causes must be addressed. And this is not only a strategic discussion, it applies on the community level and I'm mm -hmm. entirely um, with, with what has been said uh, on this. This is um, on the level of the individual making choices every day um, where you need to, uh, to address this. Uh, provide the jobs, provide a horizon, provide legitimate political uh, uh, sphere where, mm. uh, of, uh, where, where political uh, views can be, can be expressed. If that's mm. not the case, well then there's extremism. It's interesting, in the last session that I attended, looking at um, Libya and Somalia in particular, people were talking about the need to match legitimacy and power um, and how intertwined these, these concepts are. Um, Eli. Yeah, thank you. That's a very interesting angle. I think that there is a consensus not only on this panel but uh, among the scholars and experts that it's not only about military and security tactics. It goes much beyond that. But because of my work, I, work uh, I mean, I collaborate with a lot of governmental agencies in the region, and I can tell you that the level of investment and determination that the governments put in the military and security tactics is much, much higher than what, whatever they put in the non-military or non-security related tactics. And I do think that the international community has a role to play in putting more pressure through the bilateral and multilateral cooperation to more pressure on these governments to, to put more investment and more determination into the non-military, non-security related uh, mm -hmm. tactics. There is a huge gap. Uh, even the countries who have national plans, like Tunisia, for example, there's a huge gap between how much they're investing in their military, their police, mm -hmm. and how much they're investing in their civilian or whatever aspect mm -hmm. you want to call it. So I think there is a, a serious work to be done here uh, on how to shape the <coughs> multilateral and bilateral cooperation models to cater for this. I want to shift to talk a little bit about a different level of governance, um, which is the, the role of regional institutions. Um, we've talked a little bit about the UN in terms of setting a framework and promoting this, this approach with, with, with member states. Um, but we also have a number of really important regional security institutions um, that have taken on a role in prevention um, and in many cases are, are pushing again to, to be more effective, but are, are challenged by their internal dynamics, challenged by their own capacity and challenged by the realities of how budgets are allocated. Um, Ruth, what's, what's your view on, on how, do, how do regional security organizations play into this conversation? So apropos the comments, of course, that we heard this morning in the first plenary session, from my perspective, there is definitely a need for a new multilateral <laughs> regional organization. And this would be a regional security regime. Uh, it wouldn't be a, an alliance where you're looking at traditional balance of power. You're looking at a multilateral organization with collective, um, collective goals in certain cases. I'll talk to the national and collective goals in a minute. And there is a recognition that these are competitive relationships that need to have a norms and rule-based organization and also have to show self-restraint. So right, there's leadership in, in governance. So leaders have to show self-restraint. So I would say there needs to be a new architecture in the Gulf, for example, um, and I'll talk about that in a minute, but there are certain challenges. Uh, who are going to be the players in this new multilateral regional organization? How do you get them to the table? Uh, how do you give a particular organization legitimacy? So just very briefly, on who will be the players, I think there is a place today to see the GCC states plus Iran and Iraq uh, 
um, in some type of multilateral regional organization to prevent tamp down violence in addition to prevent extremism. Now, this is easier said than done. How do you get people to the table? I will say that I ap actually see an opportunity at this point in time with the U.S. retreat or attempted retreat from the <coughs> Middle East and a lack of response to the drone attack, the tanker attack, the oil field attacks. I think there's a recognition by players in the region that it is in their best interest to work together. Look, to put it in the vernacular, the other guy's not going anywhere. And so there has to be a recognition that uh, there has to be an organization to deal with it, make the red lines, et cetera. Uh, the last thing I'll say is, you know, the comparative is very informative. You can look at ASEAN, you can look in Africa, at the regional economic community um, for, for examples on how to make this. But I think there's also, how do you get people to have buy-in and legitimacy, or this organization to have legitimacy? And I think there's a need that you have to convince players that not only can the organization bring strategic benefits on the collective level, but they can bring strategic utility on the individual state level. Now, it's great that these two will dovetail, but I think that's very important. So I think there's absolutely a need. There isn't an organization that exists right now in the Middle East, I would argue, and I think this could be a good framework on that level. I mean, I think this is a really interesting question to think about what, what structures are needed for particular purposes. Um, we've seen that alliances come together to address particular problem sets. Um, we've been having a pretty robust conversation thinking about the Red Sea as a shared space um, where you need to have plumbing that connects the regional organizations, um, and that's you know, it goes up and down the entire Indian Ocean. Um, I think the, the idea of a strategic prevention fund that could allow for a, a common approach, so it's probably something that merits some, some even uh, deeper conversation. Um, before we turn to questions and bring our, our, um, our participants into the conversation, um, I want to turn back to all of you and, and pose sort of another big picture question, which is what, what are we missing in this conversation on prevention and resilience right now? Um, who are we missing? from the conversation. Um, what do we need to do to, to advance it effectively going forward? And I'll take, you can go in any order that you want, Ambassador Your. Thank you. I, th I think we've just heard one piece that we've been missing, because we've been talking about non-state uh, extremism. This also applies to state-sponsored extremism. If you have um, means to address issues that fuel extremism um, from, from one side, then um, they work uh, with, with everybody, uh, irrespective of the organizational type. So our experience in Europe has been very similar. The Conference on Security in, in, in Cooperation in Europe has, to some extent, made the Cold War livable and uh, kept us, probably kept us all alive uh, during mm -hmm. that time. And it was essentially a table where everybody could sit and talk. Uh, and this is, mm -hmm. uh, from what I understand, what has been proposed. Yeah, I, uh, well, I mean, I come from the Middle East, and I think that one important aspect that uh, is being missed is the fact that, you know, the majority of the people in this region uh, believe that violence is a legitimate way of achieving their own interest or preserving, mm -hmm. you know, protecting themselves. Mm -hmm. Uh, and this requires a long-term intervention or long-term plan that uh, you, I mean, I don't, see, I don't see how you can resolve this issue with three to five years, you know, action plan. So this requires a much longer term approach and it requires obviously a, a commitment in funding. And I don't think the international community has to commit to this funding. So it has to be an effort from the communities themselves to, to see how to deal with this issue. But this is, this is a point that is usually being missed. Yeah. It's really interesting. Unfortunately, our colleague from the African Union wasn't able to join, but I imagine at this point she would say something about the silencing the guns agenda for 2020, which is entirely premised on this notion of shifting the mindset that there are ways to, to resolve issues outside of violent conflict and eventually seeing that translate into to differences. Ruth, Nikolai, so I, I would just add very, very briefly, I think one of the missing elements, I think it's out there, but we have to discuss it very concretely, is in this era of growing nationalism and populism, how do we convince, and it's sort of the getting the people to the table, how do we convince states that this collective action 
is in their best interest, right? Mm -hmm. So how do we overcome this collective action problem? Mm -hmm. I think that is one of the most important elements here in being, to, being able to create a regime, of course, that, um, that works and is effective, and of course will help countries develop, uh, um, address those human security issues as well that I mentioned at the yeah. beginning. It's really interesting to bring that in. As, as we talk about the shifting multipolar world, there's a lot of changes within that are, that are driving some of those, those changes. Nikolai? As someone who comes from the Balkans currently living in the Middle East, please forgive my historic uh, skepticism of international congresses or conferences to solve other people's problems. Um, I think we're missing two very important aspects. One is we, we don't have enough time. Um, conflicts in the Middle East are um, unfolding very quickly. Uh, tensions are rising. The risk of miscalculation is uh, uh, rising by the day. So I believe very firmly we need to, to focus right now on preventive diplomacy and prevent escalation as much as we can before we can actually think of a framework to, to address this. Um, and secondly, what I, I, I really miss in our discussion is um, what type of a multilateral system are we looking at? Are we looking at a multilateral system that is ba based um, and built solely for and between states? Or are we looking for a multilateral system that is built for states and peoples, hence um, uh, with a strong element focused on human rights? Because if Do you we have a view to, on that? Sorry? Would you like to share a view on that as, as part of the discussion? Well, I think it's quite obvious yeah. where we're going, <laughs> but I would uh, very much mm -hmm. prefer that we actually in this discussion also understand that you can't have security, stability, um, and development without actually uh, um, inclusion um, of people and protecting and, um, and upholding human rights. Great, which takes us back to the fundamental idea of governance at all levels and across all levels. Mr. Undersecretary General, the, the last word to you before yeah, we turn I to our audience. I will be very brief in this regard. We need to rebuild trust and confidence. Without mm -hmm. this element, I don't think we will be successful in any case. So, of course, counterterrorism and prevention of violent extremism is a sphere in which contradictions are not very strong. Of course, there are some elements which are uh, disputable, but in general terms, member states are very supportive for counterterrorism and prevention of violent extremism agenda. It means that there is a common understanding that this is a common challenge we need to address together. So next year we will be organizing the high-level meeting of heads of counterterrorism agencies in New York, which uh, the title of the conference will be to build, uh, to build resilient societies and states. And I think it will be very crucial mm -hmm. discussion about how to restore this trust and confidence, because it's going on about engagement of very professional people who are doing counterterrorism and prevention of violent extremism every day. And very important element of the meeting will be the presence of civil society. Mm -hmm. Because if we would like to have a holistic approach, understanding what should be done by the whole society and what does it mean resilient society in full-scale understanding of this world, world, of course, the in involvement of civil society of organizations is crucial. Great. Thank you. Thank you for boiling it down to such simple but complicated um, ideas. We have just about 10 minutes left, um, so we have time for probably two or three quick questions. Um, I see a hand here. Um, we'll start there. Hello, my name is Paddy McGuinness from Hood Hood Associates, and I'm a former British Deputy National Security Advisor leading on counterterrorism. I think I'd comment, I think you've missed, and it's a question really, I, I think you've missed two things. One of them, none of you talked about technology, and increasingly that is the space in which uh, extremism is promoted and enabled, and also the promotion of violence more generally, whether that be in gangs or in terrorism. And interestingly, it's getting penetration uh, into the global south in, go in, in countries where governments don't have the technical capabilities to deal with it. So it seemed to me that if you don't deal with that, you leave an open door to what you're talking about, first thought. Second thought, the Under Secretary General spoke powerfully, I thought, about foreign fighters. But of course, we've got that extraordinary thing which we've seen in the UK with Kashmiris, in the United States with Somali, people of Somali descent in Minnesota, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, where the conflict you're talking about in a geographical or a regional setting 
run into other societies and then are played back and often are the cause of the foreign fighters coming. And it seems to me if you don't place a requirement on those countries to deal with that, then you don't address the questions. I'm really interested in what do you do about technology, the, the World Wide Web as a space generally and governance for terrorism purposes, and what do you do about getting states with diaspora populations to take responsibility for the effect they have in fragile states. Great. I think there may be a future session on technology, so we may, may defer that to some of it. Uh, yes, a question here. Um, Hubertus Hoffman, I'm chairman, founder of the Global Tolerance Initiative. Uh, I think uh, to fight to contain extremism, it's, uh, it, it's not an international issue only, it's a national one. And what do you think about the idea like United Arab Emirates has a Minister of Tolerance since 2016, someone who is responsible, because what, what we see, we come too late. Police come too late, basically not preventing, and military comes too late as well. So I think in order to educate the people, to contain radicals, it must start on the national level with the education and a, a real national tolerance agenda and the national tolerance report. Great. Um, I'm going to take one more question in the back and the woman in the red shirt. Hi. Hi, my name's Jean from the Accountability Lab. Um, I was wondering, you know, based on the conversation that's happened today, which is very high level, very, very technical, very, very focused on government to government or sort of government and high level civil society, do we think that in the age of technology and how so many of these foreign fighters are quite young, is there a space to bring young people into this conversation really actively and purposefully um, and say, how can young people, how can we solve some of the very, very real challenges that young people are facing? And then say, right now we understand that often a reason for that, well, you know, often one of the reasons why you, you know, can't, you become a violent extremist or join some of these groups is because you are facing some very just practical challenges. Great. We have, we have three minutes for a very, very heavy set of questions, and the next plenary starts in 10 minutes, so I don't want to go too far over. Um, if people would like to jump in, um, feel free on any of those. Just a quick um, ambassador, and then I'll come to you. Yes, maybe uh, concerning all of the questions. Uh, um, uh, technology, uh, it's a, of course also about governance in the cyberspace, but it's not only about governance in the cyberspace, because not everything can be, um, say, governed there because some of it looks like legitimate political uh, advertisement. And there we, not only states, but communities, civil society must compete with these messages. We must engage and provide positive narratives, alternative narratives that are better than the ones propagated by extremist organizations. And uh, to the diaspora populations, um, and the tolerance, this belongs together. We cannot afford in an age where the populations of our countries are mixed of all uh, nations, uh, ethnic, religious backgrounds. Um, uh, we cannot afford polarization, we cannot afford populism, we cannot afford um, any hate speech. Um, this is uh, putting uh, extremism um, to our doorstep. Mm -hmm. I mean, it strikes me we could flip some of those questions on their heads and talk about how do you, how can diaspora communities be mobilized for resilience? How are they mobilized for resilience? Mr. Undersecretary General, you wanted to come in? Uh, I think it was a very good question about uh, use of technology in counterterrorism and in prevention. Uh, and of course, uh, to try to stop the misuse of these new technologies by terrorists, because we know that they are very fast in acquiring these new te technologies. We are trying to make the work of the office, uh, from that point of view, again, very practical one. So we are implementing one of the best technological inventions for the last period of time on the basis of Security Council Resolution 2396. It's counter-terrorist travel. It's API PNR, well-known uh, infrastructure, which is based on using of personal data presented by any person to aviation companies, and this uh, arrangement could help to track uh, the possible ways of foreign terrorist fighters uh, or other criminal people. So I think it's one of the ways how to make the 
the United Nations more efficient because technology is not an ideological term. It's absolutely practical instrument, and we are trying to use this in our work. Thanks. Thank you. Nikolai. Two, two very brief comments, firstly on tolerance. I think um, that is perhaps the defining question that we need to, to, to answer in the Middle East because there's a struggle between modernism and radicalism that is happening, and we as the uh, uh, representatives of the international community with the tools we have are not really well suited to address mm -hmm. that internal problem in countries. Um, I would say that there's some very interesting work happening mm -hmm. um, uh, currently uh, linking both youth technology and tolerance. If you look at um, um, uh, in the UAE, for example, the, uh, uh, on, the, on the countering of the terror, on, on the, the countering of the radicalist uh, narrative online, um, um, there's some groundbreaking work that's being done that perhaps needs to be looked at more broadly. Uh, but also going back to the question of really, what, how do you promote internal cohesion within societies um, remains the biggest challenge. And from the outside, it's very difficult to do that. We have limited instruments. We need strong partners inside countries. Um, and to be able to deliver that and strong leadership. Either you, Ruth, any last comments to the questions? No, I'll just make a comment quickly on, on the tolerance issue. I think uh, what's very important there is this uh, allowance of a growth of a very rich civil society. Um, it's a crucial element, civil society, of, and it serves as a bridge between the government and the people. Mm -hmm. And I think that would aid uh, in, and assist in creating more tolerant um, platforms, I think. Thank you. Very quick comment about uh, something that I don't think we've covered is the, you know, there's a new trend of these unorganized political movements right mm -hmm. now in the region. So we're seeing this in, uh, in Lebanon, in Iraq, other places. And I think that I fully understand the reasons why we, are, we reach the stage uh, of disappointment by the traditional political parties, but at the same time, this trend, if it continues, is going to become a bit dangerous. Mm -hmm. I think that you know, we're, we're going into more populism and hence more radicalization and, and et cetera. So there needs to be a rethinking of how we recreate some political structures to channel the, you know, the emotions of the public mm -hmm. in general. And fundamentally, these social movements also require a different idea of what governance looks like in response. Um, I think the lights going on is our sign that unfortunately our time is over. Um, please join me in thanking uh, the organizers who hosted us. Thank you for joining us. Thank you to our wonderful panel. Good, good panel. Very good.